All right, so you're probably wondering, well, what are we gonna do when the bullets are staggered? Um, and even if you aren't wondering that, well, you're gonna find out about it here. Um, so as we said, we would expect failure most likely to uh, happen at the forward edge of the connection. So we're expecting failure here, and we might expect a failure across through this bolt. But then we see that we have these other two bolts here, so we expect maybe failure will kind of rip through all three of these bolts. And so what that looks like is something like this. So I think we have a mental picture of what this looks like. It would kind of start to fail on the edge, rip through this bolt hole, kind of go on an angle to the other bolt hole, and then through all the way through the top. Um, so it's on this cross-sectional area now that we need to come up with the net section area. So it's not as easy as last time where we went straight across. We have to still go straight across, but then we also have to pick up additional area on these diagonals. Because remember, these diagonals go kind of towards you, towards the camera here. And so you can see that it picks up additional area compared to the horizontal projection. Let's come up with an expression now to figure out how do we get the net section area for a staggered bolted connection. Before we do that, we have to learn a little bit of vocabulary for staggered connections. Uh, so the first is S. S is the longitudinal spacing, or what we call the stagger of the connection. G is the transverse spacing, uh, and that is what we also refer to as the gauge. So the stagger gives it the S, gauge gives it the variable g. And lastly, we'll have to deal with the effective hole diameter. And again, as we talked about for a fracture, uh, this is going to be the diameter of, of the bolt plus an eighth of an inch. To determine the fracture strength of this connection, we're going to need to come up with where we expect it to fail and what path we expect it to fail on. And so for staggered connections, we're going to consider a bunch of different fracture paths. Now, students always ask me, how many fracture paths do I have to come up with? Well, you have to come up with uh, as many as you need to to identify the one that has the lowest capacity. So let's try drawing the first one. Uh, this is just like we did in example one, uh, just going straight across the member. Uh, we're expecting it to fracture in a pattern that connects A, B, C, and D. And this is kind of the basic one. I think we should probably check this path for every connection. I um, remember it's at the forward line of the connection, the uh, bolt line closest to where our load is in the member that is most likely to fail. Now we want to come up with an expression for what the net area is on line A, B, C, D. So the net area we said previously was the gross area minus uh, the number of bolt holes it passes through in the cross section times the quantity of the diameter of the bolt plus an eighth of an inch times the thickness of the plate. And this is the same that we developed uh, when we first developed the equation for the net, sec net, net cross-sectional area for fracture. In this particular case, uh, we could go through. Uh, we see that path A, B, C, D intersects two bolts across the, di uh, across the width of the plate. So we have um, A, G minus two times whatever the diameter of the bolt plus an eighth of an inch would be. Uh, times the thickness of the plate. All right, but then we saw on the bridge there that a stagger connection could possibly fail on a diagonal path, uh, one that would connect A, B to this back bolt, uh, we'll call that E, and then rip down to C and D. So I've gone ahead and sketched that fracture path in there. And so as and we'll see that as we do stagger connections, we're going to have to become comfortable with drawing a bunch of these different paths and checking the line. So coming up with a good naming scheme is a, a key to success. So for line A, B, E, C, D, uh, we have to come up with an expression for the net cross-sectional area. So this is going to be the gross cross-sectional area minus, again, the number of bolts across the width that we pass through. So For this connection, that would be three bolts. So I'll go ahead and get that information in here. That our net area is going to be our gross area minus now path A, B, E, C, D intersects three 
bolt holes across the width of the plate. Um, however, it travels along a diagonal, and we said that that diagonal ends up with more area versus as if we just looked at the horizontal project projection of that diagonal on line A, B, C, D. Uh, we would see, uh, and kind of looking there, I'm sketching that horizontal projection. Um, and so because that diagonal is longer, we have an extra term to our equation that we're going to add. And so we're going to add a term that's going to be the summation of s squared divided by 4g times the thickness. All right, and this was derived from a bunch of experiments and was found to pretty reasonably calculate the fracture capacity of these connections. When I say summation, basically every time we go along a diagonal, we want to include one of these s squared over 4g terms. And in our particular case, when we're looking at a, b, e, c, d, we traveled two diagonals, and so we would go ahead and add two times s squared over 4g, S and G would be given to us from the connection geometry. All right, S and G don't always have to be the same, so use that summation uh, judiciously. So make sure that S and G for that particular diagonal happen to be the same, or just use whatever value for each diagonal that you have. Lastly, I want to consider a third possible fracture path. So again, I say we have to keep considering them until we find the one with the lowest capacity. So let's look at A, B, E, and then travel on a diagonal back to bolt F, and then down to G. So I want to calculate the capacity now on this line uh, that is A, B, E, F, G. And I ask you, would failure occur on this particular line? So go ahead and think about it. Think. Do you think failure would occur on this line? Well, let's go ahead and come up with the net section area for this line. So in our particular example, our net section area would be the gross area minus. Now the blue path there, A, B, E, F, G, passes through three bolt holes. So we have the minus three times the diameter of the bolt plus an eighth of an inch times the thickness of the plate. And then it also travels on two diagonals. So we add two times S squared over four G times T. So we see that the net section area for this path happens to be the same as for that magenta path, A, B, E, C, D. Okay, so this is now another possible fracture path. All right, well, you can tell I'm asking questions in an incredibly high voice, so you probably are on to me, and you probably think something's up. And so uh, when we think about this, would failure occur on this line? Well, even though the net section area happens to be the same as for the magenta line, this particular fracture path, line A, B, E, F, G, lies behind one of the bolts in the connection. And that would be the bolt at point C in the figure above. So we would say, however, since line A, B, E, F, G lies behind line A, B, E, C, D, it is subjected to a lower load. And how can we make sense of that? Well, let's go ahead and take a look at a free body diagram. To do that, we're going to have to make an assumption. 
That assumption is going to be that every bolt in the cross section is going to carry the same amount of load. And uh, so I'm going to say here, for simple connections, we will assume that the applied load is distributed evenly to all bolts. And when we say simple connections, we're just basically meaning simple connections versus eccentric connections, which we'll learn a little bit more about the difference when we talk about connections. Um, and so we're going to say the P in each bolt is going to be the total load divided by however many number of bolts we have. So let's zoom back up to our figure. We have, go ahead and count them, I think we have eight bolts in this particular connection. So we're going to assume that each bolt carries one eighth of the load P. And so I keep drawing those little red arrows. And now we have to go through and we have to kind of remember good old statics. And I want to draw a free body diagram for line A, B, E, F, G. And so imagine I now draw that line and I'm going to draw just a little free body diagram of the cross section. And now I'm going to delete everything else. All right, so that's now an accurate picture. Basically what it says is that if I look at this line, this line has to only hold seven bolts of force. So, or seven eighths of the total load P that's being applied. So our net section area along A, B, E, F, G is only subjected to 7 eighths of the load P. And so when we think about would failure occur on this line versus a line like A, B, E, C, D, uh, we would say probably not because it has less load. So it's less likely to fracture because it has a lower load than the same net area a, B, E, C, D, that was subjected to the full load of P. Alright, so I hope you enjoyed our lesson on tension members uh, yielding and fracture. Um, if you enjoyed it and you really looked at this um, beautiful structure and want to take a visit, uh, this is the Lone Wolf Bridge here in San Angelo. So it's off of Avenue K over by the Concha River. So I recommend you come out. It's a beautiful place to take a visit. Maybe uh, take your special someone uh, out on a date to uh, to enjoy the company of this bridge. Check it out. It's a good time.